I moved to Stanford in 1970, and I was just a, about six years old. No, <laughs> I had finished college and been out for a year, and uh, yeah, I don't know if you know that Bill DeMent's wife is my cousin. And uh, the summer before, the summer I moved out there, uh, they had come to the East Coast for a family wedding, and I uh, subsequently got a phone call from Bill, come out and work in my lab for a while. So, piled in a car, drove to the West Coast, got dropped off there, and started working in uh, Bill's sleep lab. At the time, you know, it was a very exciting time there. A lot of discoveries, a lot of you know, action in the animal labs, new things going on in the human labs, and I learned at the foot of the master. He taught me how to do hookups. He taught me how to score sleep records, and so I always tell my students they're one once removed from the inventor. When I started um, learning about or thinking about circadian rhythms was really had part of the data that led up to the um, multiple sleep latency test. So Bill had uh, done a little study with some of his students called the 90 minute day. And that was done because he had a theory that if you broke sleep up like that and people um, could substitute activity for REM sleep, you would do away with needing REM sleep. And of course, that wasn't the case. That's not what happened in the 90 minute day. And then we subsequently tried to study the 90 minute day again and did a few um, new studies with actually recording sleep uh, better and controlling some of the conditions better. And actually, this whole process is really what got me hooked for sure on science was analyzing the data from the 90 minute day study. So in the 90 minute day, we had them on the schedule for about six and a half sidereal days, which was about 96 90 minute days. And before they would go to sleep and after they would wake up from their many nights, we would assess their sleepiness level um, with the Stanford sleepiness scale. And so one of the analyses that I did, and I remember distinctly sitting there with my pen and paper because of course we didn't have computers then, and looking at the data and watching it just the pattern emerge. And it was spectacular because if their nap had REM sleep in it, they were sleepier beforehand and showed much better alertness after. If their nap had stage four in it, they weren't as sleepy beforehand and were sleepier after. And it was just to see those patterns and then to see them as a function of time of day. And uh, it, was, it was so much fun, and it, and it taught me that, well, here's a process that's going on. Sleep is continuing, and there's this, and we subsequently looked at, we only had oral temperature, so we hooked up uh, the REM sleep data to the uh, oral temperature data, saw the nice circadian, we didn't call it a circadian pattern then, I don't think, but a temperature um, related pattern. So, I mean, just to see things come out and emerge like that and to, and I did this and I was still a kid. I hadn't gone to graduate school yet. So part, you know, part of sort of staying in science and meant you really should go to graduate school, which I did. And that's when we started the work with the MSLT. The MSLT emerged from this 90 minute day because we saw that well, people could indeed fall asleep at different times. It took longer at certain times than others. But, it, but at the time, people were studying narcolepsy um, in the clinics with a single nap. And there were a lot of false uh, negatives in, in a single nap protocol. So we, we initially thought of it, this is a way to get a good handle on people's um, physiological sleepiness, and possibly to use it in the clinical setting as well to detect REM onsets um, across time. So we, we did, I don't know, a lot of studies on the MSLT 
um, during my graduate, my, actually my graduate years actually weren't very long, but we set up the lab in the, um, in the dormitory every summer and had a whole cadre of students who would go out carrying, you know, we'd get a tr Bill's truck and get a polygraph from this lab and the animal labs and another lab and, sh and carry them out to the dorm with long cables to wire everything up and, and signals from the room that were based on uh, the turn signals on cars and would flash a light in the in our little tech room and uh, it was it was great fun because uh, I got to work with young people and train them. I mean that's when I really first started doing stuff with with students as well in that summer program. Anyway, so we looked at the MSLT nine ways from Sunday and then Gary Richardson was one of the um, undergraduate students who was in that program. And I don't know if you know Gary, but he's a very, very bright young man. Well, he's not so young anymore, <laughs> none of us is. Uh, but he, he was the first one who really started talking to me about circadian rhythms. Now he was working with Chuck Seisler, um, who had come to Stanford to do his, some of his research. So he was, or he was also working with Elliot Weitzman at the time, and, and he was doing his uh, graduate program kind of split between both labs. Anyway, Gary, I started using the word circadian, and Gary assured me that I was using it wrong every single time I said the word, and which was intimidating. Gary can be very intimidating, even as a young man he was. And, uh, and so I tried to learn more about it, and one salient moment was in the 1978 sleep meeting, um, Colin Pittendrig was the keynote speaker. The, this was the meeting in, in Palo Alto. And I got it from his talk. I understood what Gary had been trying to tell me, that it's really, you know, it's not just clock time, it's in this intrinsic process, and you really have to look at things not strictly by the clock to understand if there's a circadian process. And, and it was, I don't know, it's another one of those moments. Oh, okay, you know, there's something and maybe I can learn more and contribute to this. And Gary and I together worked up some data just to look at the 24-hour pattern of this sleep tendency in adolescents, um, well, actually college-age students, and elderly people to see if we could see an age-related difference in the patterns. And indeed, of course, there was. And, uh, and actually, hanging on the wall in my office, Bill DeMent had someone or someone volunteered to paint that graph that was in the paper that Gary and I wrote. So I have this painting of just these two curves hanging on the wall in my office. It's, uh, you know, it's just... I don't know. We get these things, and it's lots of fun. I know you're interested in the, an art and science intersection. Um, so that was kind of my introduction to circadian rhythms. What's interesting, it, during that time, we were doing the MSLT, and one of our findings was this finding of the change in daytime sleep tendency during adolescent development, um, where as kids hit mid-puberty, they would, they, before then, they were pretty much alert all day long and then would have, as they hit puberty, this trough in the middle of the day. And this is on a schedule where they're getting plenty of sleep. And uh, we didn't know how to explain that finding at all. We sort of hemmed and hawed and said, oh, it's, uh, yes, as you mature, you need a siesta. That's it. <laughs> and... Um, that was always a mystery to me, as was, uh, going back a little farther, our initial study when we sleep deprived people and then did MSLTs after recovery sleep and it didn't recover uh, in the morning. So the morning MSLTs were low and then climbed across the day and we had no idea what that meant. It takes more than one night to recover, but, but what did that really mean? So we then go forward pretty far 
I guess the next seminal moment was when I learned about the two process model. And for me, that put together so many of unanswered questions from data that I had. What is this midday thing in adolescent development? Why is the recovery process looking like that? And, and then when we did our forced desynchronies and put it you know, to the test of really pulling out the circadian part and the process as part, and then you know, another bolt of lightning. Of course, it makes sense. Uh, you know, you're waking up at a different circadian phase. You haven't replenished your homeostatic, you know, and, it, and it's just, there's clock-dependent alerting. Oh, what a miracle. And it, it, you know, in some ways it makes you feel like, how dumb were you not to have seen that earlier? And how smart is, uh, you know, Alex Borbe <laughs> to have seen it and to have told us about how, you know, kind and generous to have let me in on the secret. So, you know, that's the basics of where I started and where I've gone. And now, you know, we're trying to do better and learn more and um, work these things out in a little more detail the best we can. As an undergraduate, I studied psychology and, uh, and had no real idea what I wanted to do with it. I mean, this was, I graduated from college in 1969. Um, and those who were aware then know it was a very different time and a big time of protest. A lot of, um, we lived through, you know, not 9-11, but our version of um, disasters occurring socially and politically. Um, <clears throat> and so when I graduated from college, I had no idea what to do. I went to Washington, D.C. and was a a social worker. I lasted about two months. I grew up in a very small town that was um, not very socially aware, didn't have much. There was one family, a Filipino family in my town, and so I didn't have much exposure um, to the, I kind of grew up in a bubble, and the, my college was a kind of a continuation of that bubble. And so when I got into social work in Washington, D.C., that bubble burst a little faster than I could keep up with. And, you know, it was a good place to be at the time, uh, marching on Washington and all of those exciting uh, events. But, um, but I, you know, uh, I was out of my element, to say the least. But the exciting thing is the chance encounter the, of the family relationship was to get you in a field that took your heart. Right. I mean, this is the secret of success in the sense of having a lifelong passion, is that you land somewhere where you're full of astonishment uh, yeah. and curiosity. Uh, absolutely true. I mean, I, you know, when I was growing up, I knew I wanted to know more about the brain. When I was in ninth grade, I went to the library my school, give me a book about the brain. And they didn't have any. <laughs> and so I didn't have those resources. And then so I went and played field hockey and tennis. And <laughs> you know, I figured out a way to survive adolescence. Um, but then, and the one sort of backstory to my getting invited to go to California that I didn't find out um, until after my parents had passed on, Pat and Bill told me uh, subsequently, I had, I, that summer I got invited. I was all set to go to graduate school in, um, in Pennsylvania in educational psychology. I was admitted to the program, ready to go. Not really committed to the program, but it was, you know, something to do next. And, and that was when Bill called and said, come on out. And my friend said, go on out. Um, and I, and Pat and Bill told me subsequently that after our, the family wedding that all our families had been at, um, my father had called Bill and said, you know, Mary needs something to do that's more than this thing she has planned. Do you have a job for her there? And, and he did, and I went. And, the rest is history. 
but it, but that my dad was that insightful, I think, was pretty impressive. In other words, he realized you needed a challenge of greater quality than educational psychology. Yeah, uh, yeah. And he was right. And, and he, he was, was totally tough. right. And Bill was incredibly patient. And it turns out, you know, there are certain things that that come easy to me. Um, writing being one of them, and Bill encouraged that and fostered that and uh, and mentored me in that regard. And I think that's been part of why um, I've been able to do what I've been able to do. That and loving and loving the process of doing science. Um, and the people I've worked with. I mean, for me, a lot of it also is the people as well as the science. And so, you know, when you think about those people, Bill DeMann, Gary Richardson, Chuck Seisler, um, he, he did the first studies um, looking at uh, the delayed sleep phase syndrome in the same dormitory that my lab was in. So we, my lab was down here and we set up another lab up on the other end um, that summer, and he and Gary were up there with the with the delayed sleep phase syndrome, and uh, and that I mean it was just so such exciting times to be there and so much fun and you know Elliot Weitzman had come to Stanford and had worked there and you know another brilliant and thoughtful individual, but uh, one image that's in my head um, forever is. When I got my PhD, Chuck Seisler and I marched together at graduation because he was getting his degree too. So here we are marching to get our degrees. Um, so I mean, it was it was a good place to be and a nice fit. When I moved, it was uh, thanks to another individual I met, Tom Anders, who was a um, his. What he's done more is sleep in ch infants and children. And he was the inspiration for sleep camp, where we did all the studies, um, and the longitudinal studies in adolescence. And he's also who removed me from Stanford by offering me a job um, at Brown and Bradley Hospital. And so that was, that was the next jump, and I, I haven't jumped again since then. <laughs> I know for me, one of the best things of doing science has been the friends, and the, 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 the quality of the people who you can get more than just with your tiny little brain on something. Oh yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think about, um, well, there's the friend side of it, but there's the also the, the sharing brains. I, <clears throat> one of the best things I ever decided to do was to serve on a study section at NIH. Um, and it was, it was the most fun ever. I mean, reading and evaluating grants is hard work. And of course, I always hated the evaluating part because I, I always pictured the poor person sitting at home when they got the scores back. But the process of those meetings, um, sitting there with Emmanuel Migno here and Ruth Benka here, and um, <clears throat> the quality of minds around the table and what they knew and how they could explain things. It was just Richie Davidson. I had never heard about this stuff of, uh, you know, how he measures emotion and how he gets physiological measures of brain activity and it was so exciting and so much part of what's missing really to be done well in sleep. And then when Bob McCarley started chairing that, Bob McCarley is a polymath. He knows everything about everything. At least that that was how it felt in that committee. I mean he's not only doing in vitro molecular studies, he's doing whole animals, and he's doing clinical work with psychiatric patients and imaging, and, and he knew everything. And it just dazzled me um, to, 
I mean, I'm a little kid from a small town and they let me sit in the room with them. That, I mean, that's how it feels many times. As long as I've known you, you've been involved in um, mentoring next generation. And not just study section grants, but hands on. Well, that's the fun, that's the fun part too. I mean, when I went to Brown, my position at Brown is not a teaching position. And the first place, or maybe the second place I went was I traipsed over to the psychology department and said, please, sir, may I teach your students? <laughs> and they have graciously let me teach the students in the psychology department for, since 1985. And, that, you know, I need the students. Um, they really, I, yes, I, they help with my research, but they also help me stay I don't know, in the ball game, I guess. Uh, and it's fun. What I'm excited about now is, and again, I'm just learning, it's all of these things that part of me wants to be doing postdocs every year in somebody else's lab to learn the next thing. And, then, and so I try and do the little bit I can. And you kind of get pushed a little bit by what, where's the money coming from and what will they let you do? What do you have to do to stay in the game, I guess? And so I started, you know, as more and more of the molecular biology is coming out, we're thinking more in those ways. I started trying to put little pieces into my grants. And so, you know, that when the, I think the first paper was maybe the gene association with the morningness, eveningness, that's all tiny little associations with a certain polymorphism, and then the advanced sleep phase syndrome. And of course, I can't possibly keep up with all of the stuff that's coming out of the circadian labs doing the fly work and the, I mean, it's, it's just, it's beyond what I can do, but looking at these um, small, polymorphisms that seem to hang together with things happening in humans made me think, well, maybe if we're getting circadian period or, you know, these intermediate phenotypes, is there a way we can use some of those to study them? So I've written that approach into a couple of grants. One finally got funded, but I started becoming very frustrated with, with that well, we're going to do this and we're going to, you know, drill down and get this measure from these young people and then we're going to look at two or five polymorphisms seemed not efficient and not the best way to go. So I wrote, so it occurred to me, well, people in alcohol and people in cardiovascular disease and people have developed sort of more focused gene chips that have more of the picture, more relevant genes. And I know people are doing these expression studies both for sleep and circadian rhythms. Isn't there some way they can make me <laughs> a chip that I can use? So I said, well, maybe I can get the experts together and the experts can tell me if there's a way to do this. So I wrote a grant proposal to NIH and said, please let me bring together <laughs> experts to talk about the feasibility of a chip that will be, have the sleep and circadian rhythms genes on it. And one institute said, okay, we'll give you $5,000 to do this, which isn't enough money. So I scrambled around and it got industry, a number of pharmaceutical companies to, to donate and, and the generosity that they express, but more so the generosity of the scientists who are the experts in these areas to agree to come to this, which we had about six weeks ago in March, uh, excuse me, April, this workshop uh, was stunning. I mean, it was, you know, people from Joe Takahashi, Fred Turek, um, John Hoganish, Joe Bass, Carla Green, Chiara Cirelli, you know, I could go on. And again, it was great for me because I, I, all I got, had to do was just be a sponge and get to hear these brilliant people talk. 
and and tell us what they know and what they've learned. And people, Phyllis Z, talking about the circadian uh, sleep disorder genes, and David Rye with the restless leg syndrome gene, and and uh, uh, people from the narcolepsy group, and um, the sleep apnea genes. So we heard about the waterfront, and then we sat down and talked about, so what do we do about it? What can we, should we have a gene SNP chip that's focused on sleep and circadian rhythms? Should we have a gene expression chip? Should we, how can we get cohorts to study? Well, how are we defining our phenotypes? And people, the level of excitement, and I don't know if it was just me and I was in some hypomanic phase, I know I was, but the excitement that everyone brought to it was, it was thrilling. And we're gonna continue and push forward and, and maybe this will help not just me, but others, and, and I hope it becomes sort of international because you really need cohorts to have international enrichment, not to mention the let's, helping figure out what the phenotypes are that we should be looking at. Um, so for me, that's the next wave or the current wave, and I hope I can you know, mount my surfboard and ride that wave too because it's really exciting. <laughs>